I've so enjoyed sharing on uh, these game-changing prayers, starting the series and then bringing it to a finale. Um, there are two, two prayers that Paul puts in writing to the Ephesian Christians, and to me they are real game changers. They have changed the game of my life, the trajectory, the direction, and have blessed me in so, so many ways. And uh, they will change your life if we can grasp them, what he's actually saying, and also actually experience what he's writing down. So for Paul to write down two prayers, think about it, like he's praying for these Ephesians and he's obviously realising that his prayers are inspired and, he, and he's starting to, he writes them down and says, guys, you've got to experience what I'm talking about. And in chapter one, and I shared this uh, three weeks ago, the, the focus is where he is, you take this off, guys, I'm not ready yet. They jumped the gun, they're so enthusiastic. They're saying, you've only got this amount of time, so just get moving. <laughs> but in chapter one, um, the, the prayer that, that he prays flows out of, of his just sharing with them who they now are through faith in Jesus Christ. And Paul lists, down, lists the benefits and the privileges that are now ours through Jesus. And when you read chapter 1, verses 4 to, 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 to 14, it's just one sentence. He doesn't actually put full stops, commas, semicolons. He gets so excited about saying, guys, you've got to, got to understand what God has done for you through the life, death, resurrection of Jesus and the giving of the Holy Spirit. And he says, you've been called, you've been elected. God called you. God has elected you, chosen you. He's adopted you. He calls you son. He calls you daughter. He's forgiven you of all your sins. He set you free from the enemy. And uh, you now are seated with him in heavenly places. You have a position of privilege and honor. And he lists all these things. And then he kind of goes, oh, I just got to pray. And he prays that God will illuminate them. It's really a prayer of illumination saying, Lord, open their eyes that they would understand the richness of your calling upon their lives, the incredible hope that they have now through Jesus Christ and the amazing power that's within them. So his prayer is one of illumination, whereas chapter three, his prayer is one of, now I want you to appropriate, I want you to appropriate what I'm saying. And now the focus, you can whack it on now, fellas. He starts off by saying, thank you, Jesus. And his prayer, I've summarized it in just one phrase. And he prays, that they would experience and that they would appropriate the unlimited, limitless love potential that's within them because God lives within them and that the limitless power that they can tap into because God lives within them. That there are no two hard baskets. There are no impossibility barriers. All things are possible with God. He is a miracle working God who can intervene in our lives and break into the natural order of things and, and cause amazing change. So he, he, he prays a prayer, and I've called it from limitless love and limitless power. That's the kind of prayer that, that he prays, that they would experience the limitless love and limitless power of God now that they are new creations through Christ. So let me read this to you now, this prayer. Fantastic prayer. Because when I think of all this, this is Paul, this is the New Living Translation. Because when I think of, of all this, I fall to my knees. I can you imagine him? As I'm thinking about you guys. I fall to my knees and I just start to thank God the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. He's just reminding us that there's no one bigger, there's no one greater. And uh, he is the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. And uh, verse 16, it goes, and I pray that from his glorious 
unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. In other words, his spirit lives in you. Okay, his spirit is in you. You're not strangers to the Holy Spirit if you're a Christian. If you're a Christian, he lives within you. But he's actually now saying, you know what? But is he, has he made his abode in you? And then he goes on to say, then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. He's actually saying, is he really at home in your heart? I'm praying that the house of your life will be inhabited by Jesus Christ. He says, you've got him there, but where have you put him? Just in the bathroom? In the kitchen? Perhaps in the lounge? Not the bedroom. Kind of the out, the shed? Is when you have a house... And uh, all of us live in a house or a home. You kind of inhabit it, don't you? You, you, you? you dwell in this thing. You make your home in this house. So every nook and cranny, you should know every. And you go into every room, isn't that right? Or some of you saying, I've got some teenagers. No, I don't venture in those rooms anymore. So he's using language to say, guys, he's in you. He's in you. But have you allowed him, and he's praying that you will, that, that you allow Christ to make his home in your hearts as you trust him? Notice that? You won't let him in unless you really trust him. And he's trustworthy. I've known him 45 years, and he has done me no wrong. I've let him down, but he's never let me down. He is so trustworthy. He is so good. He is so kind. And so to tie his hands and say, well, you can be in that room, but you can't be in that one. He's saying, open the entirety of your life and let him make his abode in your life. Not just as a temporary dweller, but to really live deep down within. He says, he goes, and then he goes, your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. In fact, the NIV says rooted and established in love. Rooted and established in love. And he uses actually um, um, ag an agricultural and an, and an architectural illustration. He's actually saying that uh, the deeper the roots, if you plant trees, and uh, my wife and I, we've planted some trees at the back of our place, and uh, I said to her, sweetheart, come on, let's just get some olive trees in the front. And she says, no, that's divorceable, <laughs> even though you are Greek. We're not putting olive trees out the front. I said, what's the matter with you? So we've compromised. We've got grapefruit trees, mandarin trees, orange trees, all at the back, and now we're looking for a good walnut tree, one that the, 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 the nuts just crack in your hands, and, and they're the biggest ones that you can find. So we put those things there, we've, and all of a sudden we've got an abundance of crop. There's so much fruit that the trees are falling over, almost. And so, but the, the, the thing is, you will get an abundance of fruit when the tree is planted well and the roots are deep down. And Paul is saying, is I want you to, to be rooted and established in love. And, and that word established is, is an architectural term saying, like your house is strong, like your house is secure, like your house is earthquake proof. Because in Ephesus, there are lots of earthquakes in that part of Asia Minor. And if the, your, your house is earthquake proof, it'll stand. And the only way it can be earthquake proof, Christians, is when you have allowed Christ to make his abode in your heart and your roots are deep down in him, in his love, and you'll be established. And notice this, and may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide and long and high and deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to fully understand. 
Then you'll be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. I mean, this is a pretty powerful prayer. And he's saying, you need his limitless love flowing out of you. You know why? Because you live in a real world where there's a lot of lack of love, where there's a lot of problems, and there's relationship breakdowns. I mean, you're dealing with people every day, and, and not all of these people are nice people. In fact, sometimes even good people do things that are not very nice. Even Christian people sometimes do things that are not very nice. What are you going to do? When an earthquake comes and all of a sudden the relationship that you thought was strong and going well, it's kind of there's rumbles taking place, there's pressure underground. Is that house going to fall over? It will if you're not established in Christ's love or haven't allowed his presence to so establish you deep down that when the trouble comes, the house could fall over. Could be in your marriage right now. Could be with your children. It could be with neighbours. It could be with work associates. It could be with anyone and everyone. In fact, the people whom we love the most are the ones who have the power to hurt us the most. Isn't that true? Stranger. He may do something terrible, but he's a stranger. But if it's somebody who we know and we have a relationship with, and so Paul is saying here, you need the limitless love of God, otherwise you're not going to be able to function in your relationships in this real world that we live in. You need the, his, his presence to transform you, your character, and to let his love let the love quotient go up because you need it every day. Is there a week that passes? Tell me honestly here. Is there a week that, that passes where you're not challenged in this area of loving somebody? Of relationship? Because life is all about relationships. What's the Bible's theme? What's the great theme of the Bible? Relationships. It was, oh, no, it's about worship. Or it's about second coming. No, no, it's all about relationships. God relating to us and we relating back to him right relationship and then we have right relationships among ourselves it's all that's what life's about the whole of the scripture is is all of, is, is actually a book of relationships and so he is saying here you need if you're going to experience God in his fullness you need to to sow yourself deep into him rooted and established in love then you'll be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. And uh, there, there is so much division and hatred in our world today. I haven't seen uh, such divisions and hatreds and racism and uh, kind of separation, not wanting to belong and, and uh, individuality coming to the fore right across the world than ever before. So you have you know, the UK that decided to pull out of the European, we don't want them anymore with a new relationship, and, uh, and, and people are pulling their hair out, saying, you know what, if the European experiment falls over, you know why they put it together? Prime Minister Churchill put it together in the 1940s, and President Rosa, because he said, you know what, we've had 75 million people killed in two world wars in Europe. Can we kind of get along and maybe form some kind of forced relationship? And of course... Now, the pressures are there. People want separation, individuality, do their own thing. And uh, we're seeing it in the United States right now where there's huge divisions and, and, and to kind of everyone's rights and, you know, black rights and white light, rights and, and uh, everyone's rights, gay rights and female rights and almost like individual nations and groups within. And that doesn't speak well of, you know, we're, we're focusing on division and not what unites us. And, and that's, that's the sinful nature of man. Separate individuality and not thinking about the common good, how I can be as loving and as giving and as generous to others, to the stranger, to the foreigner. And, uh, and to think how, I think racism would have to be probably the, the, the clearest expression of sin. 
that we make judgments on a fellow human being who's made in the image of God based on their race, their looks. Terrible. That's happening in our world today. And it's not pretty. Yet there are some fantastic examples of leaders. Like I think of when that dear old man, Nelson Mandela, came out of prison. And the media had painted him a picture like he was a devil with horns and he's going to come out and unleash terrible vengeance. I talked to, I've talked to black men in South Africa. One man who's a Zulu and he was our taxi driver. And he said when he was a young boy, he was 18, 19, he goes, if Mr Mandela came out and said, I want you to kill the whites, he goes, he would have done it. There was so much anger and so much pent up frustration. This man said, I probably would have done it. Because without came this man who just somehow said, no, we've got to forgive, we've got to pursue justice. And he epitomised like a Christ-like figure of saying, let's bring people together. Let forgiveness, let love. I think of, of Mr. Gorbachev, Mikhail Gorbachev, an old man now. But you think about him. For those of you who remember, he had control of more nuclear weapons and more armed forces. And he could have unleashed a horrific purge in the old Soviet Union, like Stalin and Lenin and all the others did, but he actually gave up power and dismembered the old Soviet Union. And uh, basically, just like, and, and they say his roots were his mum was an Orthodox Christian, Russian Orthodox, he used to pray for Mikhail. His daughter got saved, became a born-again Christian. So you've got examples of people who know how to to love and how to reach out in, in the political sphere. Today, we're finding, in fact, the, a lot of the opposite taking place. You know, the same thing applies in, in a community, in a church like ours, in our communities. We need Christ to bring people together. We need his love to be flowing in and through us. You have your potential enemies out there this week. People who may not love you, people who may be reacting to you, what's your response going to be? The same as a non-Christian or as a child of God to say, you know what, I'm going to be different. I'm going to live as a resentment-free zone. I'm going to endeavour to forgive. I'm going to endeavour to give. I'm going to endeavour to build... I may disagree with people. I may have legitimate disagreements, but I'm going to make sure that I let the love of Christ flow through me, flow through me. I think Paul is, is saying to the Ephesians, guys, because it's all about love, you need the limitless love of God flowing, not just in theory that God loves me, but you're experiencing his love for you. You're seeing it and you're letting his presence through the Holy Spirit tame the wildness of your heart, that potential dark side of that sinful nature that we say, nope, I'm not giving in to that. I'm going to give in to the Spirit to endeavour to forgive and to endeavour to love. I'm going to do what Jesus did. And what did Jesus do? He says here in this scripture, may you experience, verse 19, the love of Christ, though it is too great to fully understand. And he goes, and in verse 18, and may you have the power to understand as all God's people should, how wide and how long and how high and how deep his love is. Look at his love at Calvary. He's hung there. This is God himself, the God of the universe who created everything, becomes a human being and we kill him, we murder him. In his plan and purpose was that through his death on a cross that we would be reconciled back to the Father. But think of what they did to Jesus Christ. Think of his suffering. Think of his beatings. Think of the, the abuse that he experienced. And uh, terrible abuse. Verbal abuse. Emotional abuse. Physical abuse. And probably sexual abuse. Knowing those torturers. The sanitised version where they hung him up there with a the loincloth. No, he was stark naked. What those men would have done to him in those hours before his death would have been unmentionable. Because he experienced the human condition, not just living among us, but he actually experienced the most evil intent and actions of human beings. Why? 
I think because to identify it with this lost world of ours. And he suffered and he went through so much. Yet he's, as he's hanging there on the cross, as he's hanging there, he thinks of something that he can say to the father, something positive about his murderers, something positive about the people that were baying for his blood. And he finds it, it's ignorance. They don't know what they're doing. Father, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they're doing. So even as he's dying, even as he's being murdered by these terrible specimens of human beings, Roman executioners, when you see Mel Gibson's The Passion and look at the faces of those executioners, that's probably right. Murdering scoundrels who love to torture. Not just normal soldiers. And he forgave them, and he forgave us. What kind of love is this? What kind of love that denies their own feelings and considers the good of others who are bad? That's the mystery. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were ungodly. He didn't wait for us to become godly. He said, well, look, if you become a godly person, if, if you make some changes, then I'll, I'll forgive you. He actually forgave and accepted us in our sinful state, lost for eternity, but saved because this amazing love. Do you understand that love? I really don't understand it fully. I accept it. But the more I think about it, and as I read the scripture and, and reflect on the cross, it, I, I, there's still so much more that I'm learning. But you know what it does? It opens me up to say, God... God the Son, if you live within me, I want some of that love. I need some of that love. I need it in my marriage this week. I need it with my kids next week. I need it with my boss the following week. I need it with... I need it. As a pastor, as a leader, I deal with some really difficult people sometimes. Not here. Christian families are beautiful. You, 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 you're delightful. But sometimes... There's some difficult people. I remember this one guy once, and he was the most obnoxious man I've ever met. I mean, nothing in him was attractive. He looked good on the outward, but he just was awful to his wife, terrible to his kids, argued with everyone. <laughs> and like, how to win friends and influence people? Nah, he knew how to turn people off and make them despise him. And so the self-loathing in his own life through things that had happened to him, made him a most objectionable person. And it was really difficult to love him. And anyway, so I, I remember being in, in his presence and as he's taken off and I'm thinking, man... Anyway, so I, I'm, I'm withdrawing and, and you know, a crisis happened and uh, you know, something really went down bad in his life and he calls for me. And I hadn't seen him for quite a while and as I'm driving, I'm thinking, Lord, I don't really want to go and see him. It serves him right for what's happened to him. Payback, vengeance, isn't that a good feeling sometimes? Oh, that's terrible. That's my sinful nature. And I'm a pastor. I'm supposed to love everyone. And I didn't love this guy. I just saw all the negatives in him. So as I'm driving in the car, I'm thinking, oh, Lord, help me. So I'm praying, this way, Lord, help me. I don't want to be in this car driving to see this miserable wretch of a man. But he's called for help. So I'm crying out to God, saying, God, you've got to help me. So anyway, as I go into his, into his place and he opens up and talks, well, I tell you, I cannot believe the love of God that was released from this miserable, sinful heart. <laughs> it came out. It's almost like I'm standing there. Say, wow, that's got to be God because I know I don't love him. But it was like I'm loving him and hugging him and praying for him and leading him to Christ. I did everything but kiss him. I wouldn't do that. What is that? What is that? That's God. That's proof when God's in your life that you can rise above your natural state. The, the normal rules of engagement don't apply because you have the eternal Son of God living within you through the Holy Spirit. If Jesus could forgive those men from a cross, couldn't I reach out to a man 
that he was hurting people because he himself was hurt. He was wounded, he was troubled. Most people don't behave like that unless they're wounded on the inside. And my eyes were open to see his wounds. And when that crisis came, then he opened up and realised what a mess he really was. And, and so you will have situations like this and you will need to call out to Jesus and you're going to say, Lord, make me into that. I want to be rooted and established. I want to be earthquake proof. When the earthquake comes, I want my building of my life to stand. I want fruit. I want big grapefruit like this at my home. Oh, fantastic. Root yourself deep. Just make sure you're right in the love of God. Paul says that's what we need in this real world. And then he concludes, and I'll, and I'll finish with this just as a challenge. Verse 20. From limitless love to limitless power. Now, some of you need to go and love somebody this week. You need to go and love somebody and you don't know how to do it. You've got to call out to him and say, Lord, see, the more you see your lack of love, the better off you are. See, you will not change in the dimension of love unless you see how unloving you are. So where you see your lack, it's not to say, well, I'm bad. Say, so, oh, that's my lack. I need Jesus to fill that. I need the life of the Spirit. I've got to get pruned and rooted down in love. I've got to make sure the foundations become stronger. So that where you see your lack love is where you cry out to him and say, Lord, I can't do this. I need you to help me so that I'm distinctive and different to any other person in that person's world. I tell you, when people see that, it's the most attractive thing in the universe. They will say, why are you like that? And it's only because of Jesus Christ within us. Then he finishes by saying, and he moves from, to limitless power. He says, now, and I want to read it in the New International Version. I love this. Amazing what he says in verse 20 as he moves on. And he says, now to him who is able... To do, going slow here, immeasurably more than what we all ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church. That's an amazing statement. He shows us here God's amazing ability to answer prayer. And he reminds us of God's limitless power to intervene in situations that are just beyond the natural. Notice what he says. He is able to do. See those words there? He's able to do. He's active. He's not idle. Jesus loves doing stuff. He loves to save and heal and deliver and do miracles. He's not inactive. He's not dead. He's alive. He's in heaven and he's praying. And he's saying, Holy Spirit, go. He's saying... You've got to think this way. He is alive. He is active. He likes to do stuff. He's able to do what we ask. For he hears us. And he's so, he's attuned. He can hear a million prayers at the same time. And he knows who you are. And he will answer your prayer. If it's a prayer that flows out of genuine faith and confidence in him. Notice that he's able to do what we ask or imagine. For he reads our thoughts and sometimes we imagine things for which we dare not and therefore don't ask. And he says, dare to believe. Open the television of your, of your mind, the imagination. There are no limits to what God can do in and through you. What's impossible with man is more than possible with God. He's able to do all, I love that word. More than all, such an absolute word, all that we ask or imagine. Anything. For he knows it all. And he can perform it all. Then he's, look at that word more, he says he's able to do more than we ask or imagine. For his expectations are higher than ours. And then the final word, he's able to do immeasurably more. But like Paul's saying, you get it? Limitless power. 
For he does not give his grace by calculated measure. He is a God of superabundance. There are no limits with him. He can do anything. What do you need from him today? Is there a miracle that you need? That you say, this is just humanly impossible. This situation cannot, there's no answer. He says, now's the opportunity to kick in Ephesians 3.20. He says, limitless love in all your relationships, limitless power when you're facing impossible situations. He says, don't doubt me. Don't doubt yourself. Paul says, I want you to get rooted and established in love. I want you to, to really understand this. Because I want your mind to be blown at what God can do. Don't give up. There are no two hard baskets with him. What seems impossible in the natural is more than possible in the supernatural. Can you say amen to that? Let's stand together.